Press the button again. Press the button on the front. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I thank Susan and her colleagues very much for organizing this meeting and inviting us. And it's such a pleasure to be at a meeting where we're going to be focusing on kind races. One doesn't have to justify it. One knows that they are um, interesting. And also the exhortation concerns them to not only describe our latest results, but to think about them in, in a wider perspective. So, uh, so this is a great job in scene setting, and I'd just like to begin uh, with this scene setting uh, slide for what's going to come later, describing the ATP recognition side in the active form of CDK2 cyclin A. And this will be familiar to most people, but we know that the ATP is recognized through the two hydrogen bonds to the hinge region. Um, the not hydrophobic character of this um, uh, cleft, um, not all hydrophobic residues are um, indicated here, but some of them are. The ribose accommodated in this pocket making two hydrogen bonds. Within the ATP pocket, there's two pockets that have been exploited for drugs. One behind the so-called gatekeeper residue, which in CDK2 is a phenylalanine that doesn't allow exploitation. <coughs> and the other coming out here from the ribose pocket, which in CDK2 is terminated by the slicing residue. Then we go on to the um, catalytic part of the ATP, the triphosphate, organized and localized by con uh, contacts with the slicing residue, which would be the lysine 72 from PKA which in turn is organized by the scrutinate and the C-helix, the C-helix being an important um, factor in organizing the transition from inactive to active state. And the gamma phosphate localized through a metal arm, which in turn is collated to an aspartate, and aspartate at the start of the activation segment uh, with the so-called DFG motive. In CDK2, it requires phosphorylation for activation, and that's on the one sixty. And this acts as an organizing center, collating to an arginine from the C helix, an arginine that's adjacent to the catalytic residue, um, arginine um, uh, one, four, one, two, eight, no, one, huh. one, two, one, eight, yeah. No, one, two, six, thank you, RD, yeah. Um, from uh, the, the, um, uh, the loop carrying the actus as well, okay and an arginine from the activation segment. Um, this helps keep the activation segment correct for the confirmation, which in CDK2 is important for the recognition of the substrate with the sear promotive, organizing searing them to be directed in line to the gamma phosphate of the ATP, ready for transfer of the phosphate through the participation of the catalytic aspartate and the slicing two residues from the aspartate there to stabilize the transition state. So, um, with this uh, background, I wanted to make a digression into protein kinases as drug targets. And uh, uh, this is an enormous um, effort within the pharmaceutical industry and has been successful with anti cancer drugs, and most notably the uh, most important one of all time, um, anastomid binding to the Avis and Thalassian kinase. Enormous amount of effort into development of kinase inhibitors of anti inflammatory compounds which has led to some very interesting science, number of compa com compounds in clinical trials, but not, none yet approved for use in the clinic, and more recently, uh, protein kinases for treating neurodegenerative diseases, and, um, uh, 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 and indeed other, other diseases. 
I've uh, recently I've been uh, reviewing protein kinase inhibitors, and in order to make it manageable, I restricted to the review to those protein kinase inhibitors that have been approved for use in the clinic and are there curing patients. And with a brief history, we have 10 such compounds, starting with Placidol going back from 1999, a ROC inhibitor, but then moving on to an acetonic uh, B-rate as an inhibitor uh, for treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, approved in 2001, and later that year approved also for the treatment of gastrointestinal stroma tumors, where it's an inhibitor of KIT, which is upregulated in such uh, disease. And that has been an enormous success with um, particularly uh, uh, caught in the early stages of the disease. And latterly, there's been development of two, uh, two new compounds that have been uh, approved for use in the clinic. And the satinib is of interest because this inhibits the active confirmation of ABLE and hence has a rather more broad specificity that is proven useful uh, for those um, instances of disease which are resistant to anatomy or intolerance. And nilotinib is um, also similar, acts rather like anatomy. And then we have these two EGFR inhibitors um, approved in 2004 for non-small cell lung cancer and um, they uh, uh, inhibit the active form of the epidermal growth factor of septicycin kinase. But more recently, there's been an inactive inhibitor, which is also effective with ERBB2 or HER2, and is now approved for use uh, for the treatment of breast cancer. And finally, these two, serotonin and semitidin, which are principally EGFR inhibitors in the clinic for renal cell carcinoma. And last but not least, Tensorolimus, which is a derivative of um, rapamycin, and which is the only inhibitor in this list that doesn't target the ATP site. It inhibits mTOR, but inhibits probably um, either localization of TOR through binding to um, a related domain, or um, inhibits um, the, 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 the localization or um, substrate um, recognition. <coughs> So with these 10 compounds, let me tell you a little bit of what, um, what we've learned from that and what I want to use to relate to what I'm going to say later about our own work. So they all target the ATP site, except uh, penicillinus. Um, there are other inhibitors, um, not yet in the clinic, but for example the interesting neck inhibitor, which doesn't target the ATP site, acts as an allosteric inhibitor. The role of the hinge region I want to describe, the role of the confirmation response acts with us as inactive, and finally the role of Taylor genes. So, with apologies for John in the audience, I start with the anatomy of able um, uh, thousand kinase complex, and what we see with this one is that it binds to a unique inactive confirmation, making one hydrogen bond to the hinge region, <coughs> tucking this thermal methyl group. Uh, behind the gate through the cleaning residue, and then extending the rest of the compound, uh, tucking into a pocket uh, uh, below the, the C helix, uh, making hydrogen bond to the glutamate that's normally stabilizing the lysine, and uh, uh, favoring then the, the inactive conformation and extreme inactive conformation, which the phenylalanine of the DFT has been swung into this pocket, and this uh, phenyl thing now occupying the pocket that's usually occupied by the DFT the F of the DFG in the active confirmation. The second lip, on the other hand, is binding to the active confirmation of ABLE. It takes two hydrogen bonds to the, the hinge region. Uh, this part of the molecule is extending out, making a few contacts, but not particularly important ones. It still gets a contact to the threonine of the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the gatekeeper residue. Um, sorry, as illustrated here. Um, yeah, that's a CHO bond, um, somewhat unusual, uh, pass over that. Um, but then tucking this into the, the gatekeeper pocket, but there it stops and it's able then to bind to the active confirmation, illustrated here with the phenylalanine of the DFT in its active confirmation. And just two more examples, the Pritinib and Elessa binding to the active confirmation of the epidemic growth factor of septopyrosine kinase, only one hydrogen bond to the hinge, uh, tucking in again behind the gatekeeper residue, uh, but there it stops, and exploiting these halogens as pop, uh, blocking into a non-polar pocket. And this part of the molecule extending out into solution, um, therefore conveying uh, a pharmacological properties. 
So it's going to provide the active confirmation. And that's been fortunate uh, for those patients with uh, cancers which are uh, derived from having um, mutations in the uh, EGF kinase um, which uh, uh, confer um, unwanted activity. Lacatinib, on the other hand, inhibits the inactive confirmation. And again, we see one hydrogen bond to the range hinge, tucking into the uh, gatekeeper pocket, but then a more powerful view, again with a halogen, also exploiting the hydrophobic properties of the back there, and other groups coming out, making a few interactions, but mostly to the solvent. So what we see from here is the ability of kinases to respond to the inhibitors, either inactive or active, and we see a multitude of interactions, and I haven't done a comprehensive analysis in this very brief account, but I have pointed out the halogen uh, groups which point into hydrophobic pockets. Now the substance of that talk is to talk about um, CDK9, cytokine T, the positive elongation factor, which is involved in transcription. So we move away from CDKs as regulators of the cell cycle into other roles of CDK. And this is a schematic view of our current understanding of the action of CDK9, cytokine T in regulating transcription. So we have the strand of DNA, and we have RNA, polymerase, triangulate messenger RNA, all of it. And the uh, uh, signal for this to begin, having assembled the active polymerase, is phosphorylation by CDK7 cyclin H um, on the C terminal domain of the RNA pole 2. The C terminal domain in humans consists of 52 repeats of this tetrapeptide and CDK7 phosphorylates on serine 5 of this peptide, um, rather uh, uh, particular specificity. That gets transcription going, and then it stalls, and it stalls because these two proteins, DSIF and LELF, whose names are, are spelled out here, um, inhibit further action of RNA polymerase. And it's not until CDK9 cytokine T, perhaps with a transcription factor, can come in and phosphorylate these, allow these to dissociate, and then itself to phosphorylate the C terminal tail, this time on serine 2 of the heptide repeat, the uh, transcription then is switched to the elongation phase. Now, the role of the phosphorylation of the C terminal domain, I would say, is not fully understood, but one possible um, uh, 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 role is certainly in the recruitment of the RNA processing uh, machinery of splicing and polyadenylation. And then we can get elongation of um, uh, the messenger RNA by the RNA pole 2. So again, being a CDK, it has CFO specificity, but there is much specificity for that uh, peptide repeat in the C terminal of the name. Now, before I get on to the structure of CDK9 cyclin T, I just wanted to illustrate what we know about CDK cyclin interactions from the structures there. So within Oxford, we know about CDK cyclin A, CDK2 cyclin B, CDK2 cyclin B. And these are all variations of a theme. We see a very tight cyclin CDK interface, which is used then to activate uh, the CDK, principally by this um, H5 helix interacting with the C helix, pushing it into its active conformation, but also interactions between the um, H3, H4 of the cyclin PLCs interacting with the activation segment and this n terminal helix, which further um, substantiates the context. And a similar theme is observed with more, more exotic complexes, namely CDK5, P25, the cyclin which only has uh, one cyclin domain, but it's doing the same thing in organizing the C helix and has its n terminal helix here. CDK6 in complex with a viral cyclin, same idea, and even the yeast 485, 480 complex, same variations. So it was a surprise to us when um, we solved the structure of CDK9 cyclin T, and this is the work of Sonia Barney, who is here, Graziana Lolly, and Ed Lowe, where we observed that the contacts were much less intimate. Indeed, the rotation of the cyclin with respect to the CDK at about 26 degrees. Um, with respect to its position in CDK2 cyclin A, making uh, surface contact uh, uh, considerably smaller, and that's supported with surface plasma resonances, which indicated that the KV of the cyclin for the CDK um, was uh, uh, considerably higher than that of CDK2 cyclin A. We still have the H5 parallel to the alpha C helix, but the H3, H4 loop is uh, much further uh, displaced. And this will be important. It means that the kinase then is not quite so restricted in the CDK9 cyclin T as it is with um, C, 
CDK2 cyclase. So in these quick movies, we can see how much more open it is. And this is the conventional view. And if we rotate it 180 degrees, we can see that the upper um, M helix of the CDK of cyclase is much less uh, compact than the corresponding helix in the CDK2 cyclase. So we went ahead and um, bound ATP, and um, this binds um, then to the site exactly as it binds to, to CD, it binds to CDK9 exactly the same way as it binds to CDK2. Um, the adenine in this pocket making 200 more spiridos, um and the phosphate coming out here aligned. So very much the same story with the ATP sub pocket in um, CDK9 as in CDK2. And the only difference is if you stray away from the immediate um, ATP complex, uh, this lysine, uh, which blocks the end of this pocket from the ribose in CDK2, is replaced by a glycine in CDK9, so this pocket is much more open. So then we wanted to uh, look at um, inhibitor binding, and an inhibitor that has caught attention is flavopyridol, which is in phase two clinical trials. Um, it's derived from a natural product, um, from the bark of a tree which grows um, universally throughout Southeast Asia, and the natural product is rohitopine, uh, a flavone, and it was the substitution of this methyl group, the chlorophenyl group, that gave increased potency of about uh, 15 fold. It was used in folk medicine, and um, in 1992, it was recognized to have anti-cancer properties. It was recognized to inhibit CDKs, induce apoptosis, and also result in decreased levels of um, things like cyclin D and CMIC and other proteins. But it, it entered clinical trials in 1994, and it went through phase one just fine, uh, no toxicology effects, but then it halted. And it halted because one needed to know more about what flavopyridol was doing with CDKs. And one of the important observations is that it's really a much more potent inhibitor of CDK9 than it is of the other CDKs, as indicated with the KIs here. It's now in clinical trials for chronic lymphocytic leukemia in, patient, in cases where patients are refractory to other treatment. Um, this is a, a not uncommon cancer and quite a serious cancer. And uh, in cells, what is observed is that clinical <coughs> decreases the expression of two proteins that are responsible for um, uh, resistance to apoptosis. And a key feature of chronic lymphocytic leukemia is that cells are resistant to apoptosis. So it's not a, um, it's, uh, it's that the cells just don't know when to die. And it's thought then that flavopyridol is effective as an inhibitor of CDK9, reducing transcription, which affects particularly the levels of those proteins that have unstable messenger RNA. And these two anti-apoptotic proteins are two such proteins as indeed is cyclin D and CMIP. So by reducing transcription, you reduce those protein levels and allow cells in the tumor cells to go forward into apoptosis without interfering too much with um, uh, normal cells. So there's a renewed interest in flavopyridol as a transcriptional repressor, um, and um, it's un uh, 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 under development by Synovia Aventis. But despite early promise, the clinical trials have still been disappointing and that's because there's another important factor, is that um, flavopyridol is scavenged by human serum. It's not scavenged, ironically, by bovine serum, and that's why all the cell studies in vitro, uh, where uh, you were using um, the fecal calf serum to prove the cells, um, didn't bring this up. But in humans, it's bound very tightly to, um, we know it's bound to human serum margin with nanomolar affinity, um, and we're still investigating whether it's bound to alpha-1 um, acid glycoprotein, the two possible culprits. Now, binding to serum proteins is not by itself deleterious and can be advantageous. It can facilitate transport of the drug, it can prevent its metabolism, um, and, and can help uh, deliver it to where it needs to be. But if too much is scavenged, leaving too little free of the compound, and particularly the balance between the affinity for the serum proteins and the inhibitory um, uh, 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 properties for the target, you need to get that balance right. Now, there's been a workaround uh, with clinicians in this study reported here at the end of the transparency, where they gave patients a high dose for a short time, followed then by a dose for a longer time, 
and they achieved with these uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients results which for cancer trials are enormously encouraging. The 45% of their patients had a response with a duration of longer than a year, usually a response for just a few months is regarded as a success. And genetically high-risk patients, those are mostly patients with P53 defects, also showed a very good response. So it's back in the clinic and, and being uh, pursued, and uh, we were interested then in finding out how flavopyridol bound to CDK2, and particularly explanation for its differential affinity versus the other CDKs. So here is flavopyridol bound to CDK2, and we're comparing it with flavopyridol, sorry, flavopyridol bound to CDK9, comparing it with CDK2. It binds very similarly. With the CDK2 study, which was done for Kim um, some years ago, they were using a Destoro compound, so they didn't see the chlorine one. We see it here, and it's governing the orientation of this phenylchlorine ring with respect to the flavor. In this particular orientation, which you can adopt in CDK9, but couldn't in CDK2 because this lysine would need to move out of the way. We see two hydrogen bonds to the ring, this one rather long, and we see um, contacts here with the aspartate. But in particular, the glycine loop closes down from its active conformation um, to make an edge-to-face interaction with this, uh, with this ring. And this is described uh, uh, in greater detail here. Uh, here is flavopyridol bound at the ATP site. And this is the conformation in green that we see in the complex with the uh, phenylalanine uh, 30 from the glycine-rich loop making an edge-to-base contact with the peripheral root ring of the flavopyridol. Now, the glycine loop in its AMP, PMP combination is shown here in grey, and that's where the, the phenylalanine is. So it swings down, and that would leave a pocket unfilled by a hydrophobic group if the conformational change stopped there. But instead, the beta-3 alpha C helix loop also swings down, as indicated from this gray green, and the leucine from this loop replaces the phenylalanine there. So it's complementary changes. Now, in the CDK2 structure, the glycine loop is down, but the phenylalanine, which is a calcine, calcine 15 in CDK2, doesn't make contact. But the structure was for just CDK2 without the cyclin. And we would hypothesize that CDK2 with the cyclin, where this loop makes intimate contacts with the cyclin, could not accomplish this conformational change of closing down over the inhibitor as effectively as the more open, more relaxed complex of CDK9 and cyclin T can. So the conformational response of the CDK here, I think, is an important factor in explaining affinity for the inhibitor. And very briefly, one last story. It's going back to all the work that led to an understanding of the role of CDK9 in transcription. And an important molecule at that stage was DRB, dichlorofuranosalbenzimidol, a nucleoside analog. And um, this was important in working out the role of those um, transcriptional uh, repressors, and it's been widely used in cell biology. It doesn't have a particularly high affinity for CDK9, 0.15 molar um, Ki, uh, but it's certainly higher than for other CDKs, and it's known to be inhibited of other kinases, like casein kinase 2, but it's even less potent against that. But the question I want to ask, you know, it looks like um, adenosine, except it has chlorine atoms here, and we know the importance of those two hydrogen bonds to the hinge region, one as a donor, one as an acceptor. And the question is then, um, how does uh, this compound bind? Can it mimic what ATP is doing or what flavopyridol is doing? And the answer is, and this is a study by Sonia very recently, is yes, it can. And instead of making those hydrogen bond donor, hydrogen bond acceptor interactions, it uses the chlorine to contact the carbonyl oxygen here and a carbonyl <coughs> oxygen here, um, just perfectly poised to make these interactions from the conformation of the hinge region. It makes a couple of other hydrogen bonds there. Um, the glycine loop comes down, but the phenylalanine doesn't come in with an edge to base stacker because it hasn't got anything to stack against. So this interested me, um, and what is known then about the so-called halogen bond? Because we don't see it in any of those other inhibitors. And um, it goes back a long way. It was Odd Hassel from Norway who first observed short bromine oxygen interactions. 
And the simple thing that you want then, like a hydrogen bond, uh, refers to a short interaction where the donor and acceptor are shorter than their predicted randomized distance. So both um, uh, purely and oxygen is to be at distance shorter than 3.3 angstroms. Um, they've been reviewed recently um, by Ho and his colleagues from or Oregon, and it's the results from that review that are summarized there. In the PVD at that time, they observed 113 such short contacts, of which 70%. The, the most prevalent are halogen of our oxygen interactions. And that's consistent with the observations of the review that was done um, a little bit earlier with um, complexes, uh, sorry, uh, structures in the small molecule database um, for the cases with rapid database. And I should say that although then these have um, a, a prevalence, um, chlorine uh, in um, other halogen interactions can be mimicking non-polar interactions and indeed a quick look through the database shows a whole number of other interactions. So it's not exclusive, but I think it is of interest. And so with the halogen bond, like the hydrogen bond, we view the halogen as the bond donor, or the electron acceptor, and the oxygen as the halogen bond acceptor, um, or the electron donor, as illustrated schematically there. And the result of Ho's uh, review is the observation that this is usually linear, the uh, carbon halogen oxygen di distance when it's making interaction with the carbonyl oxygen, um, a little bit of a, 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 a twofold um, distribution. And this angle here um, is close usually to 120 degrees, reflecting an interaction of the halogen either with the low pair electrons on the oxygen or with the pi electrons on the oxygen. And with the values here that we observed for uh, DRB. So um, we shouldn't have perhaps been surprised, although we were, um, and this is because I have a relatively short memory these days, and we had done a study in 2003 with a tetrabromo compound, the CDK2, and indeed that we found that the, the bromine atoms of this compound is exactly the same as DRB, making these contacts with the carbonyl oxygen. It wasn't a particularly potent inhibitor, and we were doing this study because we wanted to compare it with casein kinase 2, which is a much, uh, where uh, this compound is a much more uh, potent inhibitor. So, uh, there is there then halogen interactions which can be exploited by protein kinases, and we were, um, as I said, surprised with the DRB result. So, to sum up, um, what we've seen with the halogen ones is that despite looking like adenosine, the direction of the halogen bonds here with DRB in yellow directed to make this position the compound in this site here slightly displaced from that which you see with ATP. So all the non-polar interactions with the ATP don't take what would be the adenine into that site, and all the polar interactions from the ribose allow it to be have a little bit of flexibility. Um, and then, and to govern these orientations by the halogen-oxygen interactions. So I think the messages I've got are flexibility of protein kinases which are not necessarily governed by, in response to the bonding, by the residues that are actually in con direct contact, but may be influenced by residues that are further off, which in turn can be uh, 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 governed by the whole scaffold of the protein kinase, or the way in which the protein kinase is interacting with other molecules, such as the, the, the cyclins. So flexibility of response and sometimes quite subtle with families, and the role of hydrogen bonds are the two messages I, I want to leave and to thank my collaborators on that, which is Sonia, who is in, in the uh, audience, Gretziana Lori, and Edio. I haven't had time to talk about uh, uh, this work. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>